talk is the great crash of 2008, causes and consequences. I fear that it will very soon be called uh, the great crash of 2009, namely when I crash on this podium. I'm a little bit exhausted uh, by our uh, wonderful evening yesterday, which was then extended throughout the night. And uh, this morning, our good friend uh, Joseph Becker took me out for tennis. Uh, and then I realized, now I realize I'm no longer 22 or 30, I'm not even 32 anymore. So I'm having a hard time standing here, but the voice is still working. <laughs> and anyway, so we, I, I, have a, I have a relatively easy subject. Uh, talking about the uh, financial crisis to uh, this distinguished group of Austro-Libertarians is like uh, carrying owls to Athens, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a home game. I gave similar talks to other audiences that were not uh, as well informed as you are, which allows me to uh, step over some parts of the argument rather quickly. And uh, so I've some some experience with uh, the, the reaction to this. One of the uh, aspects of the present crisis that started in July 2007 and still extends to the present day. Uh, one one thing that intrigued me was. It, it starts already, right? That the, the, the Austrian uh, interpretation is well received, can be communicated to a larger audience, even in France, as, which is the country in which I am presently living and, and, and teaching. And uh, if you know something of, uh, about France, uh, as far as economics is concerned, France is distinguished by the fact that it's the only country in which the economists are to the left of the general population. Okay. <laughs> Or the other way of another way of saying this would be where economists know less about economics than the average Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me uh, first uh, give a, a, a brief definition of a, of a crisis. A crisis is a situation in which many uh, investment errors become apparent at the same time. So when, when I fall off this podium, that's not yet a crisis. It shows that I've done something wrong because I can no longer stand on my feet, but which, which is an individual error. If an individual company goes bankrupt, that's not a crisis either. It's an individual investment error, and this happens, of course, all the time. We constantly have what uh, Josef Schumpeter once called uh, process of creative destruction. The, the market economy renews its, uh, itself. Uh, my uh, knowledge of biology is rather limited which I have to admit, he's a, a Professor Duisberg. Uh, but even uh, uh, one thing that I remember was that within the human body also cells are constantly renewing themselves. So part of the cells are dying, other cells uh, are being created. In the economy, it's a little bit the same thing. So this process is not tantamount to a crisis. A crisis is in a situation in which we have a particularly high number of uh, bad investment decisions that become apparent by the bankruptcy of uh, the firms. So the question then is, what explains uh, the crisis? What is the, is there a common cause or is this just a poor, pure coincidence? Could be a, a pure, pure coincidence from a logical point of view, but of course uh, that we uh, are interested in finding a common cause and Austrian economics and Austrian business cycle theory in particular gives us such an explanation uh, of a common cause of all these failures. So what I will do now in my talk is uh, uh, first talk about the causes of the, the present crisis, and I'll uh, explain to you that we can distinguish two main aspects or two main causal chains. One runs through the fragili fragility, the general fragility of financial markets, and the other one runs through uh, malinvestment. Uh, and both causes have an ultimate cause, uh, which is the same, namely uh, the presence of our current monetary system, uh, which is based on paper money or fiat money and central banking. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll come to talk about the consequences of the present crisis. And here I will limit myself to uh, discussing the uh, political reaction that has taken place so far and then uh, also address some uh, light on the horizon, some libertarian inroads that have been taking place uh, in, in the context of the crisis. So what are the causes? Again, we can distinguish uh, two main chains. On the one hand, we have the fragility of the financial markets, and then we have malinvestment. 
Uh, the fragility of the, of the financial markets has been known for a long time, uh, so it's not something that became apparent only in July of 2007 when the crisis broke out uh, on the sub subprime market. Um, and this fragility uh, has two symptoms. One is extremely low cash balances uh, at financial market participants, uh, and the other is extremely low equity ratios. Uh, so if you're extremely low uh, cash balance, then of course you run into trouble whenever you need to make a current payment or an unexpected payment and you don't have enough money uh, in, your, uh, uh, in your balance and on your bank account or in your pocket. Uh, so banks do have extremely low cash balances, investment firms, same thing. I always tell my students if, if you ever uh, complete failure in your studies, you, know, you, you won't get your degree and you have to become a robber or something else, at least you're strong or something, you can handle a gun, you will become a robber. Don't try to rob banks, right? Uh, there's no money in the banks, don't go, to, <laughs> don't go to the banks. Go to the next grocery shop or some other place where there's still some, well, bank notes and so on. So banks don't hold much, uh, much cash, uh, which makes them vulnerable to uh, liquidity crises. And this uh, uh, fragility or vulnerability of any individual bank then tends to spill over to other banks. If one bank has a, a, a liquidity problem, uh, it uh, will then uh, try to absorb liquidity from other market participants, thereby reducing uh, the money supply available elsewhere, creating liquidity problems for other market participants, and so on. So there can be a chain reaction, a snowball effect. Same thing for uh, the low equity ratios. As soon um, as one market participant goes bankrupt, um, the, the value of the debts of these firms will, will fall. So for example, if you have, have given uh, a credit to uh, General Motors, you, you, have, uh, you have bought, as, as some of my relatives have, have done, General Motors bonds, uh, and General Motors goes bankrupt, well, then the bonds will fall in value because bankruptcy means that General Motors is unable, even by selling all of its, ass its assets, uh, the entire, uh, all the, the plans and uh, the, the products, the, the, the stocks that they have accumulated and so on, if they sell everything, they will not be able to pay back the entire debt. Uh, now, so if this happens, then some other market participant whose assets are the liabilities of General Motors. So you have an investment firm, for example, who has given a credit to General Motors or bought General Motors bonds, uh, will now have a reduction of its asset size. So the assets have uh, a lower value, and therefore this firm in turn will not be able to pay back all its debts, even if it liquidated, if it's sold on the market, uh, whatever asset it has on its uh, balance sheets. So there's again a snowball effect coming from this um, uh, fact. And this is exactly, the snowball effect is exactly what we observed in the months after July of 2007. And we had a, a crisis that broke out on a, a rather narrow sub, uh, segment of the, the market, I mean the so-called subprime market. And from there on, it spilled over to the rest of the market. And it spilled over very quickly and uh, with a dramatic uh, dimensions because of the general fragility of financial markets. So to give, give you an idea, uh, we have uh, several entrepreneurs here and uh, a typical uh, firm that is not operating on the financial market would hold equity ratio uh, anywhere in between uh, 30 and 100 percent, okay, which means that out of all the money that the firm has invested, 30 to 100 percent is financed by the money belonging uh, to, to the entrepreneur, and only the rest uh, comes out of debt. On the financial markets, a typical German firm, uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, Commerzbank, uh, etc., uh, operates with an equity ratio of 2%. Okay? And in the US, it's similar. Uh, there has been much talk in the media about uh, hedge funds and so on. It's, it's true that hedge funds uh, uh, also operate with very low equity ratios, but it's less dramatic in the, in the case of hedge funds for reasons that I, explain, can I, explain, uh, I can explain to you if, you if you bring up the question later on. 
And uh, as a consequence, there, there was no problem on the, on the hedge fund market, but we did have big problems with uh, banks in Germany and in the U.S. in particular. And of course, uh, cash balances are extremely low. This is less than 1% of the balance sheet is held in form of cash. So we have great fr fragility here. And this alone, I mean, even if we didn't bring in Austrian business cycle theory, would explain uh, all essential facts about uh, uh, the, uh, some of the main facts, at least, of the, of the present crisis. And the question then is, why um, do we have these symptoms? Why do we have such fragility precisely on the financial markets? Why don't we find it in the shoe industry? Why don't we find it in the uh, hotel industry? Why don't we find it in the lamp production or whatever, or microphone production? Why is it on financial markets? So here we ha then have a couple of uh, non-Austrian, typically wrong explanations, and we have the Austrian explanation. The typical wrong explanation that we have been offered uh, in the media for the past 18 months was greed. Okay, this is the uh, five-letter explanation, greed. And uh, sometimes uh, one could get the impression that just uttering these five letters was deemed to be su uh, sufficient as an explanation uh, why uh, uh, banks and other investment firms were brought to such excesses, why they reduced their equity ratio, why they reduced their, uh, uh, their cash balances. And indeed, so from a technical point of view, it is some sort of an explanation, right? Because the, the reason why we hold equity and the reason why we do hold uh, cash balances is to protect us against the risks of, of business. We hold uh, cash balances to protect us against unforeseen payments that we need to make. And we hold equity to protect us against fluctuations in the demand for our product, of, of macroeconomic fluctuations that uh, affect the value of our assets, the values of our products, and so on. Let's say you have uh, invested, you have a balance sheet of 100 uh, million euros, which means that you expect that you could sell all your assets, your, your plant and your, your machines, your, your vehicles and so on for 100 million euros in a reasonable uh, period of time. And now uh, there is a fluctuation uh, in the demand for your product, which means that you have to uh, downgrade the monetary value of uh, your machines and so on, and you have to cut, cut from, let's say, 100 million to 80 million. If you only have 10 million of equity on your balance sheet, that is, if you have financed these 100 million uh, out of uh, 90 million debt and 10 million equity, and then you have to reduce your balance sheet by uh, 20, so from 100 to 80, you are bankrupt, okay? Because the value of all your assets is only 80 million, and the value of all your debts is 90, okay? So even by selling everything, you, you could not stay in business. So that's the reason why we hold equity. We hold equity in order to protect us against unforeseen fluctuations in the demand for our product, and therefore, in particular, unforeseen macroeconomic fluctuations that determine the overall price level and therefore the overall aggregate value of uh, assets. So if we therefore neglect to hold sufficient equity, if we neglect to hold sufficient cash balances, in some sense, it's true. It's a, uh, it's a sign of greed, okay? Because by reducing our equity, of course, we can increase the return on our own money. We can the re uh, increase the return on equity. Let's say we might make for this balance sheet that I just mentioned, we make uh, 10 million profit, okay? So we have 10 million for 100 million of capital invested, 10% return on investment. Now, that's not the, the figure that an entrepreneur is mainly interested in. The, our main interest goes to see what's the return on equity, what's the uh, return on our own money. Now, if we, let's say, finance 100% of this investment of our own money, we have 10% return. If we finance only 10 million out of uh, these 100 million out of our own money, then, of course, we would have 100% return, okay? So there is a monetary incentive to reduce equity as far as possible. There is also a monetary incentive to reduce the cash balances as far as possible because cash balances are not, uh, do not earn any money. Right? So we, rather than keeping the money in our, uh, our bank account, we can spend it and buy a, an asset that earns us a return so we can increase our, our earnings. So it's true then uh, to, 
greed is, a, is an explanation, right? Certainly, we've been greedy if we reduce our equity, we reduce our equity, our, our cash balances, in order to increase the return on investment. So greed is an explanation, but it is a very superficial explanation. It is superficial because it doesn't, uh, we, we still haven't explained why this greed comes to be concentrated, in particular, on the financial markets. Why aren't shoe producers greedy? Why don't shoe producers produce uh, with 2% equity ratio? Why don't land producers have a 2% equity ratio? Why do we find this only on the financial markets? Yeah, and then of course we get uh, various uh, pseudo-psychological explanations. Uh, according to some uh, economists, and this species is very widespread in France, uh, the financial markets, people who are having to deal with money, they are particularly prone to be greedy. Right? So if you do produce nice things such as glasses and, 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 and watches and, and water cans and so on, you're a nice guy and you're just producing whatever is natural as, as an Aristotelian philosophy. But as soon as you touch money, ah, <laughs> you turn into the vampire. Right? Ah, so you forget everything else. Um, but, but this still would not be a sufficient explanation because there is some other element uh, here too, that because uh, this is a risky strategy. Right? Because of course, we can increase our monetary earnings, but there are also greater risks. So on top of this, we need to postulate that suicidal tendencies are particularly widespread on the financial markets. So you see, I mean, we were drawn into all kinds of uh, psychological or pseudo-psychological explanations or hypotheses, uh, rather, because there is no... Uh, uh, thorough uh, psychological, comparative psychological study of uh, financial market participants as compared to other industries. Uh, maybe some uh, research will come up with this, but so far it's just a hypothesis. It's not, a, not an explanation. Uh, one of the more sophisticated wrong explanations uh, stresses asymmetric information between uh, market uh, inter intermediaries and, and the customers. Uh, so the, the ultimate question then is, why do the customers, why do private uh, capitalists who uh, have money on hand, who have, uh, who have savings, why do they invest on the financial markets? Why do they buy stocks of companies with very low equity ratios? Why do they hand their money over to investment firms that pursue such risky investment strategies? And here the explanation that we often find in economic literature stresses that the customers are relatively less informed about the risks of the products as compared to the financial intermediaries. Right? So we have the vampires, the greedy guys and so on, uh, who do all these nasty things in order to pop up the, uh, their return on, on investment. And the customers are the, the poor sheep and uh, just have a few billion dollars spare and uh, put this on the market, they, they don't really know what's going on and uh, uh, they, so their ignorance is being exploited by the financial market professionals. Now, uh, to some extent this explanation is true, of course, because we do have asymmetric information. Certainly, as in all fields, the professionals are better informed or tend to be better informed than uh, the lay people, than the, the final customers. But this we have, of course, also in under, other industries, right? Few of us understand uh, the precise operation of our computer, still we use computers. Few of us can repair their own cars or, or even understand how a car works precisely and still we buy cars, we sell cars, we're not being ripped off. So why should this be fundamentally different on the financial markets? The Austrian explanation uh, solves these logical problems and uh, stresses the impact of monetary policy and of uh, the monetary system, more generally speaking. So we have a monetary system based on uh, fiat money, which is, that is, the money that is being imposed on the economy, uh, which profits from monopoly, which profits from uh, legal tender laws. And the, the whole point of having a fiat money is, of course, to facilitate uh, public finance. And, uh, it's easier for the government to get uh, additional credits if you can produce as much money as you want and hand it out in the form of credit to the government. That's the historical reason why we have created the system. Uh, other 
explanation, other rationales have been created uh, a little bit later. Right? Uh, we need monetary policy for the macroeconomic management of the economy. Uh, we need uh, monetary policy to promote um, uh, employment and therefore economic growth and so on. But these were rationales that were invented later. Uh, so we have a monetary policy our monetary systems are based on uh, a, a fiat money that is cheap to produce, typically paper, typically uh, or electronic money, and which therefore from a technical point of view can be produced in unlimited quantities and uh, can be uh, produced at virtually no notice. So it's, it, from a technical point of view, it would be possible to increase the money supply from one day to the other by a hundredfold or by a thousandfold. There is no technical limitation. And there's also no commercial limitation. A central bank, which produces paper money and electronic money, cannot go bankrupt. Uh, you can go uh, and look up the, uh, the websites of the European Central Bank or the, the Bundesbank. Very well done. They have wonderful websites. They give you also their balance sheets, so you get the impression that it's it's a regular company because they have, have a balance sheet, right? Their their assets uh, on the one hand, I need to show it for you. Their assets on the one hand and their liabilities on the other hand, and so they could go bankrupt, right? I mean, their debts. If the debts are higher than the assets, uh, they they would be bankrupt. Well, the problem is uh, that this is. Uh, 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 accounting hocus pocus. Okay, it's the it's it's it's, uh, it's it's an illusion. The the debts of the central bank are the in fact the bank notes and the uh, demand deposits issued by the central bank. So it's uh, it's these things in fact. Right? This, is, this is Turkish money. This is the a liability of the Turkish central bank. Uh, but what does it mean? Can you? Turn this in something. Can you can you claim a, a payment for this? If you show up at the the counter of the Turkish Central Bank and say, "Well, I want to have my money," <laughs> well, they, first of all, they will not understand what what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and then, if you insist a little bit, well, they might hand you over another 10 lira <laughs> banknote, right? Or, or five? Do you, you want two fives? Or, or they won't cut in half a, a 20, but yeah. So. Uh, that's the nature of uh, paper money, that you cannot redeem in something more fundamental. If you can redeem it in something more fundamental, you don't have a paper money. Right? It's the characteristic feature of uh, paper money or of electronic money that you cannot redeem it into something more fundamental. Therefore, the bank can never go bankrupt. And it can therefore produce as much of those uh, without ever encountering a commercial problem. So in the presence of this uh, uh, central bank, then, which produces a, a, a paper money, it is uh, there's a strong incentive for all financial market participants to reduce, reduce their cash balances. There can be, in fact, no more liquidity crisis because the central bank can lend at a moment's notice any amount of money needed to make the bridge, needed to fill up the... Uh, the cash balances of the, the companies and therefore prevent a, f a financial uh, liquidity crisis, which they have done. And as a consequence, financial market participants have reduced their cash balances. So that's the explanation of the low cash balances. And, but it also explains the low equity ratios. Because uh, what central banks do is uh, to pursue the mission of stabilizing the price level. Right? That's enshrined in the constitution of the Federal Reserve of the European uh, a system of central banks and uh, of the, each national central bank, they pursue a policy of price level stabilization and often in the case of, uh, for example, the Federal Reserve, there's a second objective which uh, is macroeconomic stabilization. So what this means, ladies and gentlemen, is that the central banks, well, because they have the power to stabilize the, uh, the price level, in particular they can prevent downswings of the price level and therefore downswings of the aggregate monetary value of assets being held with, with the companies. This implies that for each individual company, therefore, there is a reduced incentive to hold equity. And that's what we said before. The, the, the only reason why we hold equity at all, rather than benefiting from uh, leverage, le, uh, the leverage effect to increase the return of, on our equity, is uh, because 
um, uh, there, there is the risk of a micro, uh, uh, down, uh, downward movement of the value of our assets. If this risk is reduced by the presence of monet macroeconomic uh, monetary policy, then of course there's a reduced incentive to keep uh, as much equity as in other industries. So central banks have the mission to stabilize the economy, but we have here a classic case of unintended consequences, right? The objective result of their policy of stabilization is to destabilize financial markets. So we are here destabilizing stabilization policies. Why does nobody see this? Why does nobody talk about this? Well, this is, uh, this is an interesting question. Therefore, I also found uh, Professor Duisberg's uh, talk uh, on Friday so interesting. Uh, in the case of uh, economics, uh, monetary policy in particular, uh, nobody talks about this because uh, uh, the debate is from the outset conf uh, confined uh, under to, to the hypothesis that we need to keep a central bank. So we cannot question the, the necess necessity of a, of a central bank. The entire debate that takes place in the professional journals uh, concerns technical issues of uh, monetary policy given the presence of a central bank. And we need a central bank, again historically as, as I've said, uh, because uh, government it's, it's, a, it's a very important instrument for government finance. So nobody talks about the elephant that stands in the middle of the room. Uh, it's, it's the central bank. Uh, in the professional journals, nobody talks about this because uh, most people uh, writing on monetary economics in the US, for example, are actually employed by the Federal Reserve. Okay? The Federal Reserve's employ, uh, Reserve employs as many economists, so writing on monetary policy issues, as the top 50 departments, economics departments in the US combined. Okay, 75% of all uh, scientific papers being published in the uh, professional journals have been either authored by uh, a Federal Reserve employee or have been funded by Federal Reserve money or uh, uh, directly or indirectly. So I give these figures not to say, well, they, uh, all our colleagues in the US are corrupt, but it's also naive uh, to assume that uh, uh, such a, a massive financial presence would have no impact on the kind of research that is being conducted and the kind of conclusions that, is, uh, that are being reached. So our monetary uh, uh, system destabilizes financial market, so it explains the fragility of the financial market. It ex explains, therefore, the snowball effect that we have observed in the, in the past 18 months. But the problems that we had were not only a problem uh, relating to the fragility of financial markets, we also had a problem uh, of malinvestment, and that's the subject, of course, of Austrian business cycle theory, which explains to us that uh, a policy of easy money that decreases the interest rate below the level it would have reached in equilibrium uh, tends to create, uh, uh, to, to, to incite investment, more investment uh, projects than would have taken place otherwise, <coughs> and that this must result ultimately in uh, an economic crisis. Uh, so the idea is, from a macroeconomic point of view, that the number of investment projects that we can successfully conduct that we can bring to completion, therefore, which will turn out uh, consumer goods, uh, depends on the availability of real factors of production, real resources. So, uh, in particular, labor, right, the, the amount of, of people, uh, laborers av available in the country, their, their knowledge, uh, and so on, human capital, but then also real factors of production, like uh, vehicles and streets, uh, plants, machines, etc. So this de determines how much we can produce. What the monetary uh, policy of easy money does is to incite the uh, launching of more investment projects than can be ultimately realized, can be uh, brought to uh, completion with, with the available real resources. So we get malinvestment. And that's the great subject of uh, the Austrian business cycle theory that has been first uh, formulated by Ludwig von Mises in 1912. And certainly we had malinvestment of the sort also in the, in the present crisis, which uh, had a few particular features. Uh, 
particular two. So we had, uh, on the one hand, the length uh, of the, the preceding boom, so the length of the period during which the interest rate was too low. And uh, it started with a dot-com uh, boom in the late 1990s, and then immediately afterward, we had a, a real estate boom in the United States. And the second particular feature is uh, uh, the international, uh, international dimension of the crisis. So it was not confined in an individual country. Uh, we had something called globalization in the past uh, 25, 30 years. So as a consequence, there is an international division of labor uh, that has been created and from which we have greatly benefited, uh, but which makes also that the, the malinvestment that uh, have, have been taking place, that is the investment that uh, should not have been made but were made under the, the impact of uh, easy money, concerned all countries uh, all over the world. So as a consequence then, uh, we have now the situation in which we have a scarcity of capital. There's not enough real, res not enough real resources available now to, con to bring to completion all the uh, projects that have been started, and this on an international level. So that's the uh, basic uh, uh, fact that one needs to keep in mind about um, when it comes to addressing the present crisis, and which unfortunately has not been kept in mind by virtually all economists except for the Austrians. Uh, and the Austrians are the, uh, the reason is that only the Austrians have kept up uh, the tradition of analyzing the capital structure of the economy. Okay, it's uh, simply a question of a neglect of an important subject by most of the other economists. So what are then the consequences uh, of the uh, financial crisis in the light of this fact? Uh, we have the political reaction on the, on the one hand and then some libertarian inroads. The political reaction I will be very brief because I'm running out of time, um, has uh, mobilized the two traditional tools of macroeconomic management, namely monetary policy on the one hand and uh, uh, budget uh, deficit spending on the other hand. Monetary policy uh, turned out to be very quickly to be inefficient uh, for a simple reason that traditional monetary policy at least consists in giving short-term credit to market participants. Now, if you're faced with a widespread or large-scale uh, bankruptcy crisis, in which companies are uh, simply uh, bankrupt, so their debts are larger than their assets, it doesn't help them if you, if you give them an, an additional credit. Right? If your assets are of the value of 50 and you're, you have to pay debts of 100, it doesn't help you if the central bank comes along and gives you another credit of of, of 50, right? I mean, your, your assets grow up, but the balance, the, your, your debts go up as well. You're not really uh, being helped. So this became especially obvious last uh, summer, uh, uh, late summer, September, uh, October 2008. Um, traditional monetary policy was hapless. So there was a glorious return of Keynesianism, right? Keynesian, uh, Keynesian uh, deficit spending. And from a technical point of view, Keynesian deficit spending can address the bankruptcy at least of individual companies because what def deficit spending allows the government to do is either to buy the products of the company, therefore propping up the, the value of their assets, or it allows the government to buy shares in the company, so uh, uh, propping up their, their equities. Now, uh, this uh, was then presented as a, as a macroeconomic uh, approach for solving the crisis, but it is not. And, uh, one of the, the main criticisms that can be made of Keynesianism is precisely that it's not macroeconomics. It's partial uh, or industry uh, level economic analysis. The problem is that we don't have enough capital on an aggregate <coughs> level. So if you're uh, propping up individual companies, and you can do this with deficit spending, you don't solve a macroeconomic problem, you just take capital out of other companies. So by solving uh, the situation, solving the bankruptcy problem for some companies, you are uh, creating additional problems for other companies. So that's the situation in which we are uh, being right now. There were a few libertarian inroads. Um, our, uh, our staunchest ally, as always, was uh, the real world, okay, reality. Uh, and that's the reason why Austrians have been uh, heard in the media, uh, uh, even in France. So even I, at, at some media presence in, in France, I was on the radio and 
uh, wrote a couple of newspaper articles and so on, have been invited to do this, and uh, some of my other colleagues have uh, regular TV appearances and so on. And the reason is that Austrians are able to explain what's going on, whereas most economists, most other economists, don't have a clue. And the uh, remedies that they recommend don't work. So we have a foot in, in the door and uh, can spread uh, Austro-Libertarianism, which is a good thing. And one of the most encouraging aspects of this foot in the door and, and spreading the message is the burgeoning debate on the gold standard, right? the reintroduction of the gold standard. Uh, so about a year ago, Austrians were the only ones who were calling for some sort of a reintroduction of a commodity monetary system. Um, and we, are, of course, we were being laughed at. Meanwhile, uh, amazing things have happened. Uh, at the Davos Economic Forum, there was a workshop on precisely this problem, reintroducing a gold standard. Uh, the Economist, the Financial Times, have been publishing articles on this uh, subject, Manager Magazine in, in Germany. And even in France, uh, in, in the Swiss press, there have been articles on precisely this problem. So there, there are signs of hope. We can therefore conclude that uh, the, the great crash of 2009 could be um, avoided. I've not fallen on this, on this podium. The great crash of 2008, contrary to uh, the uh, presentation that usually left-wing economists give, is not a sign of a market failure. It's a, a manifestation of a gigantic political uh, failure. Uh, in the course of which we are now experiencing a certain institutional deterioration because, well, we are uh, nationalizing the, uh, the economy, government pumping money into companies, buying companies to prevent them from going bankrupt, therefore, thereby turning the uh, economy into a totalitarian scheme. And on the other hand, well, uh, there is some light on the, on the horizon. Right? Some, uh, there is a possibility for, for us to spread uh, the message, and uh, that's what... I have been doing, and, and many others as well, some are in this room, and I think uh, that's what we need to keep doing in the coming months, in the coming years, to prepare the public for the next crisis right, in 2030. See you then.